title today is Living from Perfect Theology. And um, what you'll see what I mean by that. <clears throat> and Because nobody's theology is perfect, but that's not what I'm talking about there. Our theology will continue to be perfected as we grow and learn the Lord. But um, I want to start off with the first scripture here. And there's a reason that I'm going to basically recap a little bit and come from another angle to take us where um, we've been going for the several for several weeks. Now it all started maybe two, three months ago, and God dropped this scripture in my um, in my heart at a prayer meeting one night. And this is what came to me. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey and no one delivers for plunder and no one says restore. So what, what we got out of that is people are being plundered. People are being taken advantage of their prey and yet they're letting it happen because no one says restore. So they're taking a loss. If you don't say restore and you just forfeit and give up, then you just conform to what's happening to you. And he says, no one says restore. Now I think the next one's Acts 3.21. So Jesus comes to bring, to restore back. But it says, for he must remain in heaven, after his resurrection and ascension, he must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things. So Isaiah is saying, no one says restore. Jesus comes and says restore in the finished work. And then we can't go back to Isaiah and sit and let life just happen to us. We have to pick up and say restore. Jesus said that you can't plunder the strong man unless the, um, he's first bound. The strong man's bound. Then you plunder his goods. Well, that's what Jesus did. He, he um, binded the strong man. So now we plunder. We say restore. Plundering his goods is us saying restore back what the what the enemy stole or how we got in this position and shape from the first Adam. So last Adam brings back restoration and he's going to stay in heaven until we, the body, his body, restores things back to earth. And I don't think there's been a generation that's done it. And whenever, whenever there's been a generation that gets a, a, a glimpse of this, the next generation, for whatever reason, doesn't pick up with it and run with it. So I think part of that is because the missing piece of this has been theosis, our divinity through the finished work of Jesus, us becoming one with Him and Him with us. And we've talked about that a lot. We may hit a little bit on it tonight. So we, we're, we're talking about restoration. So we could stop there and I'm like, okay, but this one scripture that's gripped me since 2014 is... is um, I think the next one, Matthew, Matthew yeah. You're, when he says, Lord, teach us to pray. And this is one of the, a part of the prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's a mandate. And that's what God wanted to do through Adam, was bring heaven to earth, sink them together, because they were never separated in the first place. Heaven was before the earth, you know that, right? So he creates the earth so that they can come together as one and there wouldn't be a separation. But because of the fall, man in his mind separated heaven from earth. But it's never really truly been separated because God wanted them to work together. We'll get into that here shortly too. So what I want you to see is this restoration of all things is from heaven, which is the kingdom of God that's where? In you. So you're on the earth, heaven's in you, and you are to bring heaven onto earth under the direction and lordship of the Holy Spirit, of course. Now, both realms are being synced. Now, what we're going to talk about Sunday is both of these realms, one's eternity, one is time, time and space. And there is such a thin veil between the two. We were raised in church thinking heaven's clear up there, so far up there that if you just keep going and going and going and going and going, you'd never reach it, because that's how it works. And so we think... Well, gee whiz, it's, but it's another realm. If you could go up there in a spaceship and reach it, that would make it part of what? This realm. This realm. But because it's another realm, it's an invisible realm, it's a spiritual realm, it's, it, you, you can go as far as you want. Or you can go down to the earth, you're never going to get to hell. You're never going to get, you know what I'm saying? It's another realm. However, it's butt up against us. 
It's just, you just can't see it. So the kingdom is here on earth, and we are part, we are, we are advancing it, we're manifesting it, whatever terminologies you want to use, Romans 8, the manifestation of the sons of God. Now all of this, of course, is controversial because it is what your mindset is. If you think that the Gospels was just for Jesus and the things that He did was just to prove that He was the Son of God, the Messiah, which I find interesting. He didn't do one miracle and John the Baptist knew that He was the Messiah. So did it really take um, the miracles to prove that He was the Messiah? Because Jesus will say to His di disciples, Who do men say that I am? And Peter gets the answer right, but he says, Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. You did not come with that up on your own. The Father revealed it to you. So who told John that's the Messiah? He didn't do a sign and wonder. And yet he's doing signs and wonders, and Peter wasn't even convinced. So when Jesus says, Who do men say that I am? They're, they're talking about John the Baptist being reincarnated, Elijah being reincarnated. They're talking reincarnation. They don't, they, don't, they don't have a clue. And yet he's doing signs and wonders. So you've got you to you think, think some of this stuff through, and it's, and it's not as simplified as some would think that it is. But we're going to do on, on eternity now versus temporal, time and space. That comes Sunday. But anyway, um, so this is a very controversial subject, and it's also going to determine whether or not if you think, and these are called cessationists, that God doesn't do things today, the miracles, the signs and wonders. So that, what does that leave us with on earth? I'm supposed to manifest heaven on earth, but I can't do it through signs and wonders. I can't do it through hearing God because God doesn't speak anymore. He's, we just got the scripture. I mean, this cessationist goes, leaves us with really nothing to bring heaven on the earth. So that's when the rapture comes in for them. Because their mentality is it's going to get worse. All we can do is hold on to the fort and let life just happen, let the darkness happen, and oh God, come, hurry up, and then when the rapture takes place, we're out of here. And that, and, and therefore, why bring heaven on earth? We're getting out of here anyway, right? So another, another interpretation is that things are not going to get worse, that they're going to get better because of the restoration of all things, and we're bringing heaven on earth through this prayer, so things are going to get better. I told you this two weeks ago or so, on the parables, how they flip the parables. Whether it's a, your eschatology is dark, then you're going to look at the parables in a negative way. If your eschatology is bright, hopeful, glorious, you'll look at the parables in a positive way. So if you're looking and th thinking that things are going to get worse, then, th then they would be saying this message we're talking about is controversial. However, if you believe things are going to get better because the church has that mandate to take dominion and be the manifestation of God, they were going to, and the only way to be able to do that is to really believe what Jesus says. Watch where I go with this. It, it is, it's, it's interesting it, at best. It's interesting, all right? So let's watch this. Um, what do I mean about living from perfect theology? Well, we've done a series in the past, a year or so ago, on Jesus' perfect theology. And I want to pull off of that a little bit. But for those who don't know and have forgotten what I mean by Jesus, perfect theology, and that's the theology we live from, perfect theology. So when I say we're living from perfect theology, we're living from the theology of Jesus, not the people in the Old Testament. And I will also say not, not so much even though the Apostle Paul. Though we can glean from these, but they all have to line up with Jesus. And we'll show you what I mean by that. Here's, here's a statement that Jesus makes. No one has ever seen the Father. Now, is he lying? Of course he's not. He's incapable of lying. When he says no one has seen the Father, he's basically saying everybody, because forget Paul hadn't been converted yet, but from this point all the way back to, to Adam, no one has known the Father. So what about all these people who wrote all these scriptures? Did they get God perfectly right? Because to get the scriptures perfectly right, they would have had to have seen him the way that Jesus has seen him. But when Jesus says, no one even knows the Father but me. So no one has seen the Father, no one knows the Father but him. So that means that everybody in the Old Testament, is my Corinthians next? Mm -hmm. 
Look what Paul says when he, when he starts writing about this. For we know what? Completely? So he's like, I don't even know. He says, we know in part and we prophesy in part. Now we see things imperfectly. He's including himself, we. We. We see things imperfectly. So even Paul is going to be writing imperfectly. Because he's saying, I, 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 I'm seeing in part. I know in part. He says, in, um, like, like puzzles, like puzzling reflections in the mirror. But then we will set, see everything with perfect clarity. There's, there's going to come time for that. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. You got to listen to this because it's going to help you. Trust me, because it's helped me. Perfect and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. And in this, he talks about in the King James, we see through a glass darkly. That's we we can't see everything perfectly. He says I can't. Now he's growing in it. He's learning more. But he says I'm I'm not there. The next verse. He says that I may know him. Well, he's already been to the third heaven, probably. He's already been in the backside of the Arabian Desert where he gets the new covenant. He knows a lot. He's encountered Jesus face to face, not only on the road to Damascus, but in three and a half years in the Arabian Desert. He says, he still says, I don't know him. But my, I pursued knowing him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made transformable unto his death. So Paul is saying to us, I don't even know everything yet. And then Paul is going to pray the prayer that he prays for himself and us right here in Ephesians. Which is next. Well, we'll go, to, we'll go back to that one. Let's go ahead and hit that one since you got it there. The Philippians. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things. Or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on. To possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So next. He's just saying, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you, what? Spirit, Spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. So we don't know Him perfectly. You don't have a perfect theology right now. And people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We talked about that last week. And so there's something still missing in us when there's no knowledge of God. So when we get a knowledge of God, we grow in this thing and it, and it conforms us or transforms us into His image. What's the next one? 18? He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, your understanding, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you has, He's called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. So Paul even say, look, now watch, watch, watch what I've said so far. Jesus says, no one knows the Father but me. So that puts us in the dark to a degree. Big degree, right? But he also says, Paul will come along and says, we're looking through a glass darkly. Paul says, I don't know everything. I'm pressing on into this thing. And then my prayer is that God would open the eyes of your understanding. Right? Mm -hmm. So, if Paul is saying that about him, who is writing two-thirds of the New Testament, we can also say it's the same thing with the disciples. This is all past resurrection, post-resurrection. So it means these people are still learning. They don't know. They're learning too as they go along. As they're writing, they don't completely know. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Paul in his own, his, his, his own admittance, is that I, I'm writing this thing and I'm only giving you what I know, what I feel, what I see, what I've seen. And is it perfect? No. I'm looking through a glass darkly. So if he was, you know the Old Testament writers were. So here's what I want you to do. Is I want you to kind of get this visual. I'll just put the cross. Jesus. Okay? The Gospels. This is huge. Alright? Now we've got the Old Testament over here going this way. Going this way, we have the New Testament. In the middle is Jesus, the Gospels. That's perfect theology because no one else knows God but Him. So when, when He's speaking, He ain't looking through a glass darkly, is He? Mm -hmm. Right? There's no veil. He ain't got a veil that He's looking through. When He speaks, He's speaking 
from seeing the Father crystal clear. So you can trust every word that comes out of His mouth because He's the only one that you can trust speaking who knows the Father. Now when Moses is speaking, we don't know how much of that is God and how much is that. And we, we, we discussed this. We did a whole series on perfect theology, Jesus' perfect theology. So Jesus will come along and say, you heard it said. He'll say to his disciples, you heard it said, but I say to you. All right, he's fixing some stuff here, isn't he? Right? But he can't speak about what's to come because he'll be dead when these guys write the New Testament. There are scriptures in the New Testament that I have a little bit of problem with because I think they're either, either Old Covenant still, they don't know, and they're speaking from an, um, an unrenewed mind, but they're, they're trying and I'm going to give the same credence to these guys as I do these guys. I still think from Paul's own admission, we are looking through a glass darkly. John is still looking through a glass darkly. Peter is still looking. So if you had to choose Old Testament, New Testament, and you're not making that choice, by the way. I'm not doing what Marcion did. Marcion was an old... Yeah, first couple hundred years and he just took the, the writings of Jesus and threw everybody else out. Or no, the writings of Paul. I forget, Jesus. I think it's Jesus. And, but anyway, what I'm saying is I'm going to keep looking at these guys but I'm going to filter what I'm reading in the New Testament and I'm going to filter what I'm reading in the Old Testament through what comes out of Jesus' mouth. Now yeah, Paul will say some things Jesus doesn't talk about. But that's 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 different from what I'm saying, where I want to go. I'm going to specifically look at one aspect, is that you can definitely have the Old Testament undo what Jesus says. That's a fact. You can read what Jesus says, oh, cool, come over here, and, and you'll see something totally different. For instance, he lets a woman who's caught in the act of adultery go free. I could read it over here, and she's getting, she's getting stoned to death. Right? Yeah. Now, up here, I, over here in the New Testament, I can see Jesus, and watch where we go, I can see Jesus saying some things, and over here, if I don't filter them through what He says, these scriptures can undo what He says. You, it's not one or the other. You can't say, I can't say, hey, I'm going to show you the scriptures. I know you don't understand where I'm going, but I've got to say this, and I'm going to show you. I can't say, hey, Jesus said this. I know, but Paul said that. What did we just undo? Yeah, that can't happen. Because he's looking through a glass darkly. He's, he's speaking from seeing the Father, hearing the Father. He said, I don't say anything unless what? I hear the Father say it. I don't go anywhere unless I hear the Father say go. And if we don't, if we don't let Jesus tell us what Paul means versus... Okay, let's just jump into it because I, I'm, we've got to get set free from this. He takes the limits off. And if you don't read some of these scriptures right in the New Testament, forget the old. We already understand that. But if you, don't, if you watch some of the things Paul says, it look, or John, it looks like they're, they're contradicting what Jesus says. And because our faith can't go where Jesus is at, we automatically go here. It's safer. Let's look at the scriptures and I'll show you what I mean by that. Well, let me back up a minute and let me give you this piece. Jesus said to his disciples, there are many things I want to say to you, but you're not able to handle them. So they're right, right out the gate, they don't know everything. What is it they don't know? What is it he hasn't told them yet? I don't know. But what is it you don't know yet? That the Holy Spirit has not yet unveiled to you because you're not ready. It's got to affect the way you're living, right? Okay, so he says that to them. And then you remember the people who knew the Scriptures the best, who studied that Bible like nobody's business, and that's the Pharisees. And he said, you're reading the Bible. You ought, to, you ought to know everything, but you think that these Scriptures, watch, are going to save you and bring life to you. They're not. They testify of me. If these Scriptures aren't opening your eyes to me, they ain't helping you at all. Put the thing down and walk away. You've lost. It's over for you. They're there to testify of me. Now what does that mean? Okay, So they're reading the Bible the wrong way. They're reading the Bible and there's a missing piece. 
that brings the whole Bible together, and he's right in front of them, and they can't see it. So then after the resurrection, where Jesus appears for about 40 days, two disciples going out of Jerusalem, about a seven-mile run to Emmaus. It's called the road to Emmaus. You know this. They're walking. And they also know the Scriptures. They're disciples. And Jesus walks up, and watch this. The Bible says that they weren't able to recognize Him. Their eyes were beholden. So they weren't able to recognize them. And they don't know who he is. And then he says, what are you talking about? He says, what do you mean? What we Have you not, are you a stranger? You've not, Jesus died and was crucified. And we hear that he's rose again and blah, blah, blah. And so he starts expounding the scriptures to them about himself. He goes through the Bible, their known Bible, the Old Testament. And he starts saying scriptures to them and putting him in it. Showing them how to interpret the Bible with him in view. Because that's what it's all about. If you're reading this Bible to back up theology and doctrines, you're, you, you forget it. It's not. It is to unveil Him and Him alone. And when you do that, then you're reading the Bible with perfect theology, with Christ in view. So He's doing this to them. And I find this very interesting. Number one, they don't recognize Him, right? That's crazy, but we, we have to deal with that. How is it they don't recognize Him? Their eyes were beholden. Because... They were reading the Scriptures with a veil. He's not physical anymore, is He? He's spiritual and physical, but He's, in a, he's, he's now glorified. And He's walking with them, and they can't recognize Him after the flesh. They, now ha they have to recognize Him after the Spirit now, and they can't do it. And therefore, all that Bible did for them, their known Bible, the Old Testament, was that they read it physically, and they missed Him. And so now he comes spiritually and they can't see him because they've got the veil on. So the, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 that when you turn to Christ, the veil is removed. So now Christ is unmoving this, the veil because he said the veil is Moses. When you read Moses, the veil is there. Take, the, take Moses out of the picture and put me in the picture. The veil comes off. When you turn to the Lord, the veil comes off. The veil starts coming off of them as he's unveiling himself in those scriptures. And something happens within them. Their heart starts being stirred, burning. And they're like, and then when they finally, the scriptures opened, scriptures looking at it through Jesus, opened their eyes, and then they saw him. As long as they were reading the Bible the wrong way, they couldn't see him. But he was giving them scripture with him as perfect theology, and the veil starts getting removed, and their lives, their, I mean, it's almost like. They were reading the Bible for the first time and the right way. And then when their eyes get open and they recognize Him, He's gone. But do you see how you can't, you'll have a veil. If you, don't, if you do not look, when you don't read these Bibles with Jesus alone in view, then you're going to read it with law, seven steps, four secrets, two keys. You're going to make a manual out of it, a textbook out of it, and you're going to have a veil. The only way the veil gets removed is if you, look, if you look for Jesus in these Scriptures. Let the Scriptures testify of Him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Alright, so we know that that was a dynamic happening when Jesus was alive. Let me give you some more real quick. Jesus is in the boat with them. And He just fed 5,000. He's in the boat and he's, and he's going to teach them something about the Pharisees, their doctrines. He says, beware. And He's going to metaphorically call their doctrines leaven. Well, they goes right over their head. And when he says, beware of the, the Pharisees' leaven, he's talking about teaching, and they're thinking he's talking about bread. So while he's trying to teach them on, their, on the false teaching of the, of the Pharisees, they're like, did you get bread? No. Hey, did, did you get bread? He's trying to teach, and they're talking about bread. And he ain't, he ain't happy. He's like, number one, I don't, I'm not talking about physical bread. I'm talking about the teaching of the Pharisees, but now that you, since we're talking about bread, did you not see me feed 5,000 people and you are worried about bread rather than listening to me? You should be listening to me and forget about the bread. I'm giving you the bread, the man that comes down from heaven, and you're worried about physical bread that's going to get wormy. He's like, so what I'm telling you is they're not getting it completely. So then he's got two disciples who want to incinerate a city. He's got another one that he has to say, get behind me, Satan. I just want you to see, they're not getting the picture. Okay? 
And many of us aren't either still. Paul says to one group, you should be teachers by now, and yet i got to teach you as if we're starting all over again. He said, you should be teaching, and you still need to be taught. And I think a lot of the church is there today. But what I'm telling you is that these people are missing Jesus. They're inundated with the Old Testament. They don't know how to read the Old Testament with Jesus in view, so they're missing it. The Pharisees are missing it. They, they, the disciples don't even understand half of what he's saying. And we're in trouble here, all right? And so we still are today because we're, we're still, you got a lot of people who just, they let the Bible contradict itself then then bringing a unity to, to, the, to the Old, to the Gospels, and to the New Testament. So let me tell you what I'm talking about here. That, let me back up again and say this. Jesus will say something. I'll read something in the Old Testament. And I don't know, nine times out of ten, I promise you this. That the Old Testament will override what Jesus said. I want you to forgive somebody and you say eye for eye. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Forgiveness is nowhere on your radar. Because you're inundated with a lot of this payback mentality. That comes from the Old Testament. So right away, I've lost you. I've lost you to the Old Testament. Make sense? I'm going to show this to you. Because if we don't get this right, we cannot be the manifestation of the sons of God. We're not going to bring heaven on earth. Because what Jesus came to do was uncap limitation, and we put limitations right back on it. So I'll read something that Jesus says. I'll read something one of the writers of the New Testament says. And because, I don't, because I'm going to make them the filter, I miss what he says. And somewhere along the lines, these Gospels just get watered down. His teachings, his, his sayings. Get watered down because we take our cue from either the writer Paul or John or Moses. And, you, and, and you, Jesus has to, these guys got to bend to what he says. You understand? You got to bend. Okay, I know what he says, I may, I, but Jesus is pretty clear on what he says. Well, so, uh, let, so let me give you the scriptures. All right, here we go. We'll look at these scriptures in detail in a minute. I'm just going to throw them at you. Here's, here's, and you'll know where I'm going with this. Be it done, what? According to your faith. That's a, wait, what? I, it's kind of like, sounds like it's on me. All right? So he, where that scripture comes from is these guys, these two blind guys, Say, Jesus, heal us. And he says, do you believe that I can do this? And they said, yeah. And he says, be it done according to your faith. So in other words, if they did not believe Jesus could heal them, well, they never would have came in the first place, and they would have stayed blind. So there's a lot going on in your life because you don't have the faith to believe any different than what is happening what's transpiring. And because your mind's not renewed, or they've talked you out of what Jesus is saying, you reverted to an Old Testament scripture that kicked it out, or you misinterpreted what this guy says, and you kicked it out. But you're not believing, because you don't have the revelation for it, because faith comes from revelation, from hearing, okay? See, now watch. The other one is, all things are possible to them that believe. Now, when I, those two main scriptures, be it done according to your faith, I don't know how you talk yourself out of it. Or this one, all things are possible to them to believe. Well, God's just not doing it. We're, we're, okay, show me that scripture. I'm going to show you all things are possible, but show me the scripture that says, well, God doesn't do all that. He doesn't heal. He doesn't deliver. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. Okay, so then what? So no one, that's why no one, let's go back. This is why no one says restore. We've talked, or we've let the Old Testament or a misunderstanding of a writer in the New to talk us out of what Jesus says plainly. That's why you go by what He says. Go to the horse's mouth. Not someone looking through a glass darkly. The person that sees the Father and knows the Father is the one I want to hear. And then I'll make these guys bend to Him. And I'll make this bend to Him. Making sense? Mm -hmm. You have to read the Bible differently now. Here's one. Greater works than these shall you do, and we ain't doing squat. Why is that? Where's the greater works? 
He sends Matthew 10 or whatever. Preach the gospel. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Do this, do that. And they go out and, they go out and do it. Because they believe what He said. But we go, God doesn't do that today. And if He does, it's with somebody else. See how we've watered it down now? It's not on me now. I've, it, you know, John G. Lake can do it, but I won't. I can't. Here's another one. This is a big one. Whatever you say will come to pass. How have we talked ourselves out of that? So we, we talked ourselves out of it so bad we don't say. In fact, what we say is the negative of what's going on. We never say what God wants or what we even want. We say what's happening. Two different. You can talk all day about what's happening and you won't move any mountain. But dare say what you want to say and say it with power and authority, we won't do that. Somebody's talked us out of it or, or a scripture has moved us out of it. Is this making sense? So Jesus, so if I say to you, death is not your gateway into the finished work, Death is an enemy. And the church has made death a good thing because it puts us in heaven. And heaven is a good thing. But death is an enemy. Death is not something that we should look forward to and have hope in. But he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You have eternal life. He, ain't, he doesn't ever say you have death. The fact that death that you died is the death he died. And that's over with. Now you've got life. And death should never be on the radar. But I'll tell you this, you, it comes out of all of our mouths, well, this comes with old age. Who said that? Here's one, yeah, and this is the big scripture that undoes what he says. So Jesus says, be it done according to your faith. Paul says the outer man is decaying, but the inner man is being renewed. And we take off with that scripture and we expect to decay. We expect our backs to get our, our, our eyesight to grow dim and all because Paul said that. So are you going to believe what Paul says that you should be expecting decay in your body that it's going to break down or should you say all things are possible? Be it done, to your faith, be it done according to your faith. Greater works than these shall you do. How are you going to do greater works if your body's not in full swing? So the Lord showed me this one day, and He showed it to me a couple times. I didn't do nothing with it, and it's a repeat, and I'm like, okay, Lord, you got my attention. How is it when God takes them out of Egypt, which is taking them out of the world, out of that old mindset, Adam, Egypt is really Adam, because it, it, Adam created the world, the fallen world, through the tree of knowledge, good and evil. He takes them out of that, through the wilderness, to the promised land, the tree of life. Okay? And He puts shoes on them, and those shoes wear out in five days because they're cheap brands. Is that true? Now they've got to walk barefoot on the hot sand. Is that true? Mm -hmm. what, what happens to the shoes that the body is in? They don't wear out. And when they came out of Egypt, not, there wasn't a feeble one in their midst. He'd healed them all when they took the Passover. The Bible says there wasn't a feeble one in them. So these people are healthy and whole, and they've been put in shoes that are not going to wear out. Why is it that we think our spirits were put in a body that's going to wear out? When shoe, is he more concerned about shoes or your body? So Paul will say, the outer man, yeah, he's, that, that's, that's a thing, but it may not be a right thing. Maybe he doesn't have a revelation. I would never have said that if I'm going to go by Jesus telling me, be it done according to your faith. That I, my body's not going to see the decay that everybody else. In fact, I can show you. Start off in Genesis. These dudes were living five, six, seven hundred years old. Then God brings it down to 120 to get rid of the giants mixing with the people. Then they come under the law. Moses makes it 70. Where, 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 where's the unlimited now? He will quicken your mortal body. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken not your spiritual man, your mortal body. How is it? He, the, the body is housing. Okay, let's put it this way. Look at the temple. I can't imagine that temple rusting, the, the silver getting up with that ark in it. Because that ark is going to keep everything perfect. And I think the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God within us, is so powerful, so permeating, so leavenizing, that it's going to come through and make us 
more healthy. We're not, we're, in fact, the Bible says that in, in, in Isaiah 65, if somebody dies at 100, we're going to go, oh God, he, that was awful young. When's that going to happen? It doesn't happen in heaven. Nobody dies in heaven. So we've got to say, wait a minute, I think we have been sold a bill of goods. I think we've been lied to by religion. And no one has the faith to believe this, so they talk us out of it and say it's this, that, or the other, rather than believing what it really says. For, for instance, you're to be the head, not the tail. To be above only and never beneath. Only? And yet we settle, no one says restore, we settle for being walked all over and people robbing us and making us pray. So I'm trying to say, you, we're not going to get there if we're not going to maintain... Well, you know, Jesus said in Luke 18, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Have they talked this completely out of it? That when he comes, he finds people that just don't believe anything anymore? All right? Religion will brainwash us out of the things that Jesus speaks and just create doctrines, dogma, and undo what Jesus did in the Gospels. It will bring limitations to us where Jesus takes the limits off. Okay, we, Jesus says, say to the mountain, be removed, and the religion says, that doesn't happen. That's, that's not what he means. All right, so, what's my next scripture? Is it John, 1 John? Okay, now look at this. This is a standard scripture for us. As he is, so are we. Not in heaven, not in the millennium, in this world. So you really have to come to terms with this. This is not going to go away. You can, you can undo it somehow by what the Old Testament says, or maybe some writer in the New Testament may, may say something that you'll think, well, that undoes that. No, again, these got to bend to him. Okay? So John says, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, how do we know this to be true? In John 14, 20, Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I in you. So that means, as He is, so are we. We're in Him, He's in us. What's true of Him is also true of us. So G, Paul or John is writing this from the revelation of Himself saying, John 14, 20. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so as He is, so are we in this world. And i got to ask the question, how was He? How was He? If you had to do a, an essay on who is Jesus in this world, you'd say He's Messiah. You'd go, but what did He do? How did He live His life? And you'd have to write that down. And then you got to say, that's me. This is why you do greater works. Because He did. Hmm? Yeah. That's why all things are possible, because it was to Him. He believed the Father and moved in and, and never failed in anything. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Do I have that one? This is another standard. We can all draw close to Him with the veil removed from our faces and with no veil we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect. When you get in the mirror, do you see somebody else? So, when people look at you as He is, so are you. But do you believe that? No, religion won't let Religion keeps you looking into the mirror and saying, I'm a sinner saved by grace. You look in the mirror and go, what's wrong with you? You yell at yourself. You do self-talk that's hateful to, eat to yourself because you're mad at yourself. You're upset with you. God says, look in the mirror. You'll see me. You've got a false identity going on and your hating on yourself is not true. Someone's painted that to you and you're believing in that false perception of you. The real you is Him. As He is, so are you. So we become mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. We are being transfigured into His very image. And that's only because, not because we're not, our minds aren't renewed that we can walk in it and believe it and see it. It's already done. It's a finished work. It's done. As He is, so am I. But do I believe that? And we're growing into that. And the more we grow into it, the more we walk it out. Now watch what he says here. Being transfigured into his very image as we move from one broader level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does this. 
opens our eyes and we see who we really are. All right, 2 Peter 2, 4. Or 1, 4. As a result of this, He has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price. So that through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature. Because that's who you are. If you're, if you're in business with someone and you're a partner, it's just as much as your business as it is their business, right? You're partners. And so I'm partnering in His divinity. He's the divine one who has, entered, who has allowed me into His divinity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Theosis. That's, that's a game changer. That's the only way you're going to be able to walk this stuff out because you're not just flesh and blood. You are one with Him. You are divine. And you're walking out that divinity. As a God. Not thee, but as, the, as a God. I know they don't like that. I'm, I'm not concerned what people like anymore. I want to walk this thing out. I'm tired of them lying to me. Taking, taking my inheritance from me that I've inherited by being in Him. Now look at Galatians 2.20. I think that... John. Well, we already did John. Go to 2.20, Galatians. Well, go back to John because it's a different... I think it's a different translation maybe. So when that day comes, you will know that I am living in the Father and that you are one with me, for I will be living in you. You believe that? So that means that Je the same exact way Jesus walked on this earth for that three and a half years called Gospels is He's still walking it ag again today. In every generation, He keeps walking out His life through us individually and corporately. And you think, honestly, if that's true, I don't know whether you know that to be true or not, it, 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 how does that not be true when it's Scripture? Now, if that's true, He's pretty mute and powerless today, isn't he? Because the only way he can move that move the the only way he can move today, the way he moved that three and a half years, is through us. Now, and the reason he can't is because we don't believe that he can or that he does. Next. My old identity, that lie, that deception, it's dead. Now I know who I am. It's one of the scriptures have been saying. I'm, I'm divinity now. I'm, I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. Crucified with Christ and no longer lives. That, that, that old lie, that old man dead. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For, uh, the, for the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that He gave Himself for me, dispensing His life into mine. And you're going to tell me that ain't going to be manifesting on earth? That's not going to raise up your mortal body into health and healing and wholeness? Enoch, why in the world would God let Enoch not die? Did he get a special dispensation? And Elijah, he escapes death? Why two individuals... Escape death. Were they not in Adam? Because I think there, those are examples that we don't write off, but that that is what his plan is, is that we live very, very long. Now, if you don't want to live long and you want out of here, be it done according to your faith. And people are dying at 50. Isaiah 65 says when a hundred year old dies we're going to go oh my god that's awful young what do you think they're going to think of you when you die at 40 or 50 dude you didn't even start 70 years old is not old 80 years old is not old the, who told let me tell you another thing there is not scripture we, I, I'd, be, I'd be on board with this stop celebrating birthdays all it's doing is telling you that you're older than you was the year before <laughs> And if we're not going to handle age right, then let's get rid of... So, you know, who was it that um, Catherine Coleman never told her age right? Maybe we just be, have this, I don't know what I am. I don't really care. Does age even matter? What are we, what, what's the countdown or count up? <laughs> Death! You get to 80, man, you, you, you did good, bro. No, you didn't. We're going to talk more about this because I'm telling you there's something to this. 
And it, be it done according to your... And again, I don't know what you've been told, but when we get into this kind of stuff and I stretch your faith, stretch your... You're going to see that I will not say anything that I can't prove scripturally, but that others have misinterpreted it and twisted it. And again, you could say, well, Paul says the outer man's decay. And you don't know how many people I hear say that. That's their go-to scripture when they're in pain and they're getting older. And I say, well, isn't all things possible? Isn't it done according to your... If you want to believe that, that's what's going to happen to you. And we've just let this... this Listen, this all comes from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it's lies. And we think death is our exit. Death is an enemy. Don't ever think death should be part of it. It's an enemy. And we're going to get into that Sunday about how death works. Paul says, my departure is at hand. We'll get into that on Sunday. All right, so let me give you another one. Why this is important. And I don't have the scripture for it, so I'm going to read it out of the... Um, um, the Passion Translation. This, this, is, this is Psalms 115. 115 verse, um, verse 16. Well, let me back up and read one, the two verses before. God Himself will fill you with more blessing upon blessing that's going to be heaped upon you and upon your children from the Maker of heaven and earth. The very God who made you now, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Now, that's Old Testament. Okay, can I, can, I, can I bend Jesus or bend this to Jesus? So when I say, he says, your house will have blessings upon blessings heaped upon you and your kids. Can I, see, can I find something Jesus says that backs that up? Yeah. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Can I see something that Paul says? Yeah, he became poor so that I can become I'll give you another one. Let me find I, I wasn't going to do this, but let me let me give you another one. Psalms 112.3. Psalms 112. I gotta go back to this. Psalms 112.3. I'm I'm all over the place, but let's do this. One, Psalms 112.3. Um Great blessing and wealth fills the house of the wise. Great blessing and wealth fills the house of the wise. He has become our wisdom. He's our wisdom. So it's not up to me being wise. He's my wisdom. And if I listen to Him and hear Him, my house will be filled with wealth. But what do we do with that? Oh, I live in West Virginia. All right, talk yourself out of that one. You just did. West Virginia. Yeah, but you know, the economy, what Biden's done to the economy. That may be true if Trump gets back. See, go ahead. Do that. Let's do that. That's how we are prone to live and move and have our being by what they say and what culture is and what's going on in the world. And we bend to it. Not what the scriptures say. Not what the kingdom of God is saying and doing. Let me give you one more. Psalms... Where I gave you that one. Now let's go back to Psalms 1 where I'm going to go with this. Why am I saying this? Go, what's my next verse? Is it Genesis? Genesis? Now look at this. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the earth. That's just everything, earth and everything in it. Okay? Now, watch what he says here in, in um, Psalms 115, 16 in the um, uh, tra Passion Translation. The heavens belong to our God. They are His alone. So you can't, you can't go and tell God what's going on in heaven. Because they're His. But look at the next verse. But He has given us the earth and put us in charge. So let me ask you a question. Who's more powerful? The government of the United States or the kingdom of God? Kingdom. Jesus, Paul says... The kingdom of God does not consist in words, but power. Our governments, all they do is talk. It nothing but in their lies. Okay? No matter what government president, they lie. Whatever party, they lie. And we think, oh, don't ever go. Who's more powerful? 
If you look at the book of Daniel, he proves to you. Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man, makes an image of his place, supposed to bow, and God says, let me strip him, and I'll put him in the desert, make him crawl around like, a, like an animal. And then when he's all said and done, he gives glory to God because he realizes he's nothing and God's everything. So you can't, you, you got to get the right mentality, you got to get the right lens on. You, we, we fear man. We fear governments as if God's kingdom is not all powerful. And really, all the kingdoms of God, all the kingdoms become the kingdom of God eventually. We don't have the, we, 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 ju we just aren't seeing this thing right. That's, I'll tell you why, because it's not being preached. You know, we're here in Armageddon, like Kim, Kim Clement would say Armageddon, I'm getting out of here. That's all we're thinking about. I'm getting out of here. Armageddon's coming. Rapture, Antichrist. Man, uh, he says, occupy. You're, you were given the earth. You're in charge of it. Why are you want, I'm, I told you I'd give you wealth. I'd give you riches. I'd give you power. I'd give you everything that you need to rule and reign the dominion mandate. And you're looking for a way out. Are you waiting for him to come back called millennium? So we'll sit here and wait for him to come. For that, if you you know, some that don't believe in rapture will believe in the millennium. Some believe in both, and they're both out of whack because they get us all sitting there waiting for Jesus to finish what he started. I thought it was a finished work. If he's got to come back to save the day, what a what a pathetic bride, what a what a non glorious bride we are. And then what's all this stuff given to us? Power and authority for what? He's got to come back and save the day. No. He's in us saving the day now. That's why He's in you. You're in Him. He already came back. And we're waiting for Him to come back again when He's waiting for us. He ain't going to leave the heavens till we restore all things. And it's got to start with your life and you start saying, restore. Quit being plundered by the enemy. Quit being plundered by the economy that, that man does to us. You, Trump gets back in there and makes the economy good. That's okay, but that's not what you, makes your economy good. The kingdom does. He says, take no thought for your life. You're worried about the elections because you're taking thought for your life of how, you're going to, how it's going to be for you. And he says, how can a God say to me, unless he's a God who fathers me, if he holds all the heavens together, he's going to hold your life together. And Paul says, we'll have a, an abundance for every good work. Not lack, an abundance for every good work. All right, let's go. Let's hit these scriptures. Now, here's said all that. That's my introduction because I'm going to show you the scriptures, what, what we talk ourselves out of that comes from the horse's mouth. These are looking through glass darkly. This is talking out of the mouth of God. Right? That's why it's perfect theology. All right, first one. John four, What's John 14? All right, watch this. Can't let nobody talk you out of this stuff. Now watch. Whatever you ask in my name, that w now you think Jesus, who's all wisdom, would say, now you know, it's got to be whatever the Father wants. Wouldn't you put that little, that little caveat on there? Whatever you ask in my name, we'll talk about what it means in, in my name, that will I do. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. Is that, when we, when we go to the Father, do we have that in our spirits? Minds renewed with it? Or do we think, I ain't even going to pray. That's what Luke 18 was. I'm telling you to pray. And he says, when the Son of Man comes back, no one's praying. No one's believing. No one's decreeing. No one's declaring. No one's saying restore. That's what Luke 18 is all about. But anyway, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified. Do you understand the Father gets glorified when He answers your prayers? And you walk around and say, He ain't going to do that for me. Then that means He's not glorifying Himself. And His the goal is to be glorified. He gets glorified when He answers what you ask in His name. And he says it again. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, I'll go back and bring, bring all this together. But I'm just going to show you. These are unlimited scriptures. What's next? Alright, hit that one. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. 
Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Now you can go over here and let somebody in the Old Testament talk you out of it. You can let somebody in the New Testament say something talk you out of it. But that's what he's saying. True or false? Next. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and that's simply the union we have with him, and we are we're, um, trusting in that union. We're not living separate from it. When we are recognizing our identity and union and divinity, theosis, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. How many have, we, how many have been talked out of these things? And so many times you don't even, you don't, this is, you don't come with this kind of scripture on your lips. Next. Or your mind renewed with it. Alright, now, this is one that's supposed to build faith, and it's the very thing that zaps faith. You ready for this? Um, ask anything in my name and God and, and John says he will do it this is now this is John speaking again in 1st John this is the confidence okay confidence that we have which we have before him that if we ask anything oh there it is there it is that just talked us out of every the, all the scriptures I just gave to you this was never meant to do that and yet religion did that to us. Well, it's got to be according to His will. So therefore, all those scriptures I just gave you, we've just let fall by the wayside. Because we don't know what His will is. So all we do is, well, if it's God's will, I get healed. If it's God's will, I don't get sick. If it's God's will, this. If it's God's will, that. Where's faith? Where, where are you standing up and saying, no! And, you're, and, and where are you? You can't say anything. Say to this mountain. Well, I don't know if it's His will or not, so I can't say nothing. I don't know if it's His will. That was never meant to do that, and that's exactly what this Scripture did. And, and to be honest, if I was Holy Spirit, I'd go, no, nah, I'm not giving that to Him. Because it's not going to work. It's going to undo everything Jesus says, and it has. If it be Thy will. But it says it right there, so what's it mean? What is the will of God? Healing. How is it we took healing to, to, this, to this degree? If it be thy will. Wait a minute. Exodus 15 tells you who God is. I'm the God that healeth thee. So much so, I will give you a new name of me. Jehovah Rophe. The God that heals. Okay, I know his will now, don't I? I know his nature. I know the promises. But somehow, we kick those whatever scriptures we ask to the wayside and go back, well, he may not want to heal me. Where do you get that? How about addictions? Well, I guess I've got to live with this the rest of my life. Okay, let's talk about addictions. He, is, he saves us. The word sozo, look it up in the Greek, it means delivered. So he delivers us. Yeah, but he doesn't want me to be whole. You're talking about that long... Peace. Look the word peace up. It means wholeness. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. What are we doing? I'm telling you, the word, this here, this scripture, yes, it should have been put in there. But we don't have eyes to see. Religion's talked us out. John's saying, we know what his will is. It's called covenant. And if he makes a promise, he watches over his word to perform it. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's not up for debate. So we know what His will is. And somehow we've tweaked this to mean I don't know what it is. Now that I know His will is what's in the covenant, that's my inheritance, now I can revive these scriptures. That, and I know exactly the mountain in my life that needs to go. Called debt, called poverty, called sickness, called addiction, called anxiety, called depression. None of that. That's all from the curse. So His will is to bless... And if you find something in your life that's a curse, you know that's not His will. Huh? See where I'm going with this? Alright, Matthew 9, 29. Then He touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be. And others didn't have the faith, walked right by, I could see cripplings, walked right by Him that could have gotten healed, but didn't 
because they didn't have the faith to believe. How about the one with the issue of blood? She believed so much, she went on all fours crawling through people and he said, oh my God, your faith. You believed me. You believed what I could do and because on the basis of you trusting me, this, this, this thing has happened to you. So this is huge. I want this scripture to be gigantically huge, huge to you. What are you seeing and what are you not seeing that will be according to your faith or not according to your faith? That's the will of God. That what He wants to say and do in your life. Next. Matthew 19, 26. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. Now He's talking about salvation, but salvation in the Greek is wholeness, prosperity, um, restore back to original purpose, intent, all that. You can look it up. But He says, With man, it's impossible. So I get it, Peter. He says, Lord, if, if this is the case, who can be saved? In other words, you could say, who could be healed? Who could be delivered? Who, 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 who could ever get this thing right? And he said, you're right. With you guys, up to this point, no one's ever done it. I'm going to be incarnated in flesh. I'll do it. Put you in me and we'll do it together called humanity. But here's what I want you to see. But with God... All things are possible. In your life, in your family, in West Virginia, in the United States, and around the world, all things are possible. The problem is, we are seated on earth and only believe what earth wants us to believe and see. But God would say to you, come up here, like He did John in, John, in the, Revel the book of Revelation chapter 4. Come up here, a door was opened to me. You have an open door. It's called seated in heavenly places. And all God's trying to do is get you to come up here and look down here from what He's saying and doing. Mm. Not what's going on in news, media, and election, or this, that, or the other. And therefore, you can't speak nothing. You remember the crab mentality? Mm -hmm. I feel like that. I feel like every time I get this thing, I get this thing going, there's people that out... Who do you think you are? Get back down here. You're not interpreting that scripture right. Get back down here. God's not doing that. Yes, everybody's going to have this is going to happen to everybody. And and all every time I go to I can feel. I don't know if you can. I can feel them gripping me. Get back down here. Who do you think you are? This is how it is. Cuz every I mean they they don't want you out of the bucket. They don't want you to get free. They don't want they love their religion. But we can get out of it. It's called revelation. Paul says, open the eyes. Phew. The truth will what? Set you free. But we can. But they're not going to let you go easily. That's why I say I'm at the point, I don't care what people think about me or what I believe because I've let that limit me. I've, let, I've, I've seen these scriptures and so, yeah, but Paul says this. I've seen this. And he says, yeah, but the Old Testament says that. And we limit Jesus and these unlimited scriptures. Okay, let's go to the next one. We have faith in God. In other words, he's saying to them, have the faith of God. Truly I say to you, now this is the scripture I want so bad to jump into, but every time I go to teach it, the Spirit brings me back, because I think there's things we need to develop before we can get this. But I'm just going to throw this to you in seed format. Down the road we'll develop it when we're ready to. I don't know if I'm even ready for this. But this is huge. And don't let the faith teachers disrupt this scripture. He says, have the faith of God. That's the literal Greek. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, now truly, I'm not lying to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. Don't let the crabs bring you back down to their mentality. Don't let them put unbelief in you. Don't let them hear what I'm saying and they take something over here or misinterpret something over here. He says, listen to me. If you do, if you, whatever you say... Take up cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen. Believes that what he says, you've got to speak it. You've got to speak to the mountain and believe that what you're saying is, not might, is. Because if you say, I don't know, I hope so, you're in unbelief. You're doubting in your heart. If you can say it and believe that it's going to happen, you know you've got faith in what we're working there. So, believes what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. It will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and believe that you have received... Let me back up. 
Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, past tense, already yours. Now that's when you go into the Thanksgiving mode. And they will be granted to you. If you can't go into Thanksgiving mode, you don't have faith in that area. You don't believe you already... So, if you know you've already received something, you can be happy about it now. If I'm a very trustworthy guy, and you've seen me do it in the past, I've never let anybody down when I say things. If I say to you, if I say to Brenda, I'm going to give you $10,000 as soon as something happens, I've got some money coming, but God told me to give you $10,000. You know I'm going to, I'm, that I'm not the kind of guy that lies. Now, if I say that to you, and let's really try to believe that I'm saying this to you. I'm going to give you $10,000. I'm going to no, $100,000. You're going to go home to Kevin, and are you going to say, what's on TV? Is that the first thing out of your mouth? Are you going to go, I'm supposed to get $100,000. I don't know. Or are you going to go, you're not going to believe what just happened. And he's going to rejoice. You're going to rejoice. You're no longer waiting. or ex you are, You're into expectation and thanksgiving mode. Now when you can get there, you know there's no doubt in your heart. And there's no condemnation to have doubt in your heart. He knows you're going to have doubt in your heart. But he's trying to get you out of that doubt. And into faith. And the way to do that is hearing what God is saying and doing. Going up to heaven, having a seat in heavenly places and see what He's doing on earth that you are there partnering and co-laboring with Him to have happen. And, and you say, well, but that back to His will. No, if it's stuff like healing and provision and all that kind of stuff that's covenant, given and promised and granted, it's yours. Go for it. Speak it. Speak His word. What did the guy say to Jesus that wanted his daughter or somebody healed? No, you don't got to come to my house. What? Just speak the word. Right now, when you speak it, she'll be healed. And they figured out the minute he did it, she was healed. And that, that's Jesus. Okay, but is not Jesus and us doing the same stuff, the greater works? I'm not going to listen to religion anymore. I'm doing this thing. <laughs> i got to make this thing happen. Because I'm not going to... I did a message years, years ago saying that God sets a table before us. And let's not leave anything on the table. Everything that's on that table is yours. Go for it. Don't, don't go to heaven and this, what, you didn't get this, you didn't get that. It's all on the table. It's before you and you chose not to have it. It's like Mephibosheth who goes to David and everything on that table is his, but he's got this, oh, I'm, I'm just a poor sinner and these guys are really his brothers and, and daughters. I, I'm not worthy for, for, for... No, David went and got you, brought you here because of covenant with his father Jonathan, with your father Jonathan, everything mine is now yours. You're at the table. You eat like they eat. You take what they take. So, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. What is Jesus is now ours. So you find out what's on that table and you go for it. What's next? Here's one. I'm just. I'm. I just. We don't believe this, but but it's there. Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundredfold. Now, Mike Murdoch didn't say that. Kenneth Copeland didn't say that. I'd be weary of a hundredfold. Come on, Ken. This is, not, this is not a faith teacher saying this. But he will receive a hundred times as much now in this present age. Houses, brothers, sisters, if you lost your family, whatever, all that, along with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. He's saying there's a hundredfold for what you lose for the gospel's sake. For me. What you lose, what the world takes from you, you have to believe you're going... What's this? What's this? Restore! But I'm not only just saying restore, I'm saying hundredfold restore. We can't get our faith there. Ah, forget that. I just gave it to you. Did I not? You, this is why if somebody steals something from you, oh my God, you get a hundredfold back. Why sweat that? Hmm? 
Next. We'll develop these down the road. I'm just, I'm just trying. Remember, it's the gestalt. I'm just throwing everything at you and the kitchen sink. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing. Now, we just saw something. Go back to the scripture we, we, just, we just did. He says, if you've lost stuff, houses, family, whatever, what you lose for me, you get a hundredfold back. Now, that means these people were being persecuted. They were going through suffering, right? But he said, don't worry. Don't let the suffering depress you because there's going to be a hundredfold in this present age back. Right? Look at the next verse. I want you to see this verse and the next verse to go together. I, Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory hundredfold. Watch. The glory about to be revealed to us. That which my eyes are open to. That which I'm going to receive. I'm going to get it back for the creation waits for the eager longing for the revealing manifestation of the sons of God. What are they doing? They're saying restore. They're restoring. What is being stolen, they're restoring. What's wrong, they're making right. What the enemy has done, they're bringing back um, wholeness and restoration to that area. Next. Is that it? Now, I got another thing of notes here, but I think that's good enough. There's so, and, and really, don't just limit hearing what God is saying by the scriptures. There's things He's going to say for you to do this. And you're not going to find the scripture. Like, go buy that building. You're not going to find that. Look all day long. Ain't going to be a scripture there that says, go buy the building. So you're going to have, well, go do this, say this to this person. Get, go do it. You have to start hearing, knowing that God is like, we've got to get, we're, we've got to get back to the Father's business. And so we've got to start saying, wait a minute. Once we know who we are, and that we are partners, and that we are co-laborers, and that we are ministers of the kingdom, then we ought to always have our eyes and ears open. Lord, what are you doing? What are you saying? I'm not here just to be here. I'm here on a mission. Every day, every hour, every place is a mission. And you've just got to always be tuning in. What are we doing? What are you, what are you saying? What about this? What about that? Always bring everything before the Lord and hear what the Spirit is saying. And then when you move in that, you're going to see things starting to happen because they have to. Because the earth is yours. And you are mandated to restore things. If, you're, if somebody's sick, pray for them. If somebody needs something, help them see something, help them get it. Whatever, you got, whatever the Spirit tells you to do. This, our, our mandate is to bring God and His goodness and kindness to a people in the dark. And whatever that is. Whatever that is. And there's so many things. But it's you and Jesus doing it. Just know you're not doing this alone. So you can just maybe visualize Jesus in there with you or beside you. I don't know how it works for you, but just say, Lord, what are we doing here? What are you, if you were here and you are in the gospel days, what are you doing? But please, don't ever compromise His sayings. We are to amen His sayings. Even though this, say, this says something different. And it will. You've heard it said, but I say to you, Okay? And these people have to bow to Him. Here's, let me just say this one piece that I've never heard anybody say, but it's no big thing. It's just, I've never heard anybody say it. When Paul wrote two-thirds New Testament, he dies 68 A.D. It's a pretty safe guess. 68 A.D. Okay? This is when he dies. He never read the Gospels. They weren't written until like 80 A.D., 90 A.D. So he doesn't know what Jesus said, be it done according to your faith. Well, he, no, he said he went to Jerusalem and he only spent 11 days with the disciples. He, he, he couldn't have got everything in, a, in, in, in less than two weeks, 15 days, whatever it says. I'm just, and then I can tell you that the disciples said, we don't understand everything that Paul says. Peter says, Paul's writings are hard to understand. So the disciples didn't understand Paul. Paul had yet not been able to read the Gospels because they weren't yet written and he didn't spend time with them to get, a, get all that. So when Paul says the outer man's decaying and the inner man's being renewed, he may have half of that right because he didn't know what Jesus said. That there were greater works. Be it done according to your faith. All things are possible. And when you understand the whole concept of death and decay, that's not what he brought. That's not abundant life. 
and that's not what he brought. There's so much, and again, I have not even scratched the surface. There's so much being taught today about it, books being read, written about it, that you're not hearing because they don't believe it. But let me ask you a question. And I was going to share this several times, and I keep forgetting, but I've got to share it because it just came. Let's say, for instance, a kid is pretty good in basketball. And um, he's in high school. Good enough to get to college. I don't know how, what kind of college, but he's good enough to get into a college, maybe a scholarship. But his dream is to be in the NBA while he's in high school. What are the odds, honestly, that happening? It's rare Kobe Bryant comes out of high school and what? Goes right into the NBA. That's rare. So you can't hope for that. <laughs> so just rare. But let's say that he's got a dream of being in the NBA. And so he's really going after it. He's doing everything he can. I mean, Michael Jordan wasn't that great in, in, when he played, was it North Carolina? He wasn't that great. He became great. I mean, he was good, but not like he was in the NBA. He, he, he developed. He evolved. So this, this kid's got all these heroes and all these, and man, he's going to do it. But he never gets to the NBA. It was a pipe dream. But that dream made him one of the best college ball players there were. Didn't make it to the NBA, but he was big in college. So what I'm going to say to you is, what if I'm wrong? What's well, this whole theory's wrong? I will have become everything I was supposed to be. Think about it. Versus, ain't going to happen, so why try? We're all going to hell in a handbasket. We're all waiting for the rapture. Why do it? No. What if this is true? What if, what if everything on the table is yours? And you go after it. And you get only half of what's on the table because I lied to you about the other half. But you still got more than not believing anything at all. My mentality is, I don't know how much this is, but I'm looking at the Scriptures, and I'm seeing this. But even if I don't see the complete consummation of it in the way I see it, I guarantee you I will get as close as I can to that, and then I'm going to get on the other end, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Not a guy who took his talent and buried it in sand and said, wait for the rapture. It's a win-win for us, guys. If it's real and true, we win. If what I'm saying is halfway true, you still win. But if you don't believe anything that I'm saying, and you just the rest of the rest of the crabs in the bucket, you're burying yourself in that bucket with the rest of the unbelievers. I don't want to be there. Yeah, there's a lot of unbelief. Because they're listening to the world. They're inundated with the world and religion. And, they're, and they look and say, well, no one else has done this. What makes you think you can do this? Well, that's the problem. No one ever got out of the bucket. Gotcha. Moses had to pitch his tent outside the camp because nobody was seeing the glory. And they missed it when it moved. Um, so, yeah, you know. Anything, anybody else? Anything else? Father, we bless you. We thank you. Lord, help us see this thing even more clear. Adjust where we're missing it and where we're not seeing it. Open our eyes to even more of it. But Lord, we want to see your glory. Lord, we don't want to miss anything that's on the table called finished work. But Lord, we want to do all that you've called us to do. Give us a seat, which you already have, but give us the seat by opening our eyes to that seat in heavenly places. Let us look down on earth from heaven and operate from that realm alone. Not from heaven, not from earth to heaven, but from heaven to earth. We've got to see what you're doing. We've got to hear what you're saying. That's exactly what Jesus did. And that Christ in us is still hearing the Father by the Spirit and moving through us and living His life through us. You're going to fill this earth with your glory. And you're going to use us to do it. Make us willing participants and give us the eyes to see to be those willing participants and bringing heaven on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.